Welcome everyone. Uh, we will now start the lecture two of spatial statistics and spatial econometrics. In this lecture, I want to talk about characterizing spatial data. So spatial statistics provides us two broad uh, tools uh, to delineate patterns in spatial data. The first is called spatial heterogeneity. The second is called spatial dependence. The first, that is spatial heterogeneity, is more about spatial trends and we will look at it uh, in more detail in a minute. And spatial dependence, as the name suggests, is about dependence of how, you know, events are happening across space. So spatial heterogeneity characterizes spatial trends in mean values across different locations in space. And when we talk about mean values, mean is the first moment of a random variable, right? So we are viewing the world in as if, you know, the, the events that are happening are random events. Right? That is how statistics is entering the, 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 the domain of understanding the happenings in the real world. And then we talk about spatial, you know, what we are saying is how are these happenings across space and spatial heterogeneity is saying how different are the average, you know, intensity of events that are happening across space. So uh, mean being the first moment of random of a random variable, spatial heterogeneity can be termed as the first order property of spatial random variables. As an example, what you see on the left bottom corner is a, uh, you know, is, is a observation of uh, signals at different intensities across space. What you see is that there is this, uh, you know, a blue square box where the intensity of signals is quite high. So the count of the observations or events happening is higher in the blue square than everywhere else in this, in this box. So what's happening is that if you think about a spatial trend of incidence of this event, we can draw, you know, we can draw, you know, a trend towards the blue square that is in the middle where the intensity of events becomes larger and larger as we move towards that box, right? So there's some kind of a spatial trend that is occurring, uh, you know, in this picture. Oops. Um, the second, uh, you know, tool that we have is, is called spatial dependence and spatial dependence is a property of spatial st stochastic prop processes or spatial random processes in which the variation of outcomes may be related across space. So now how these outcomes vary across space may be different at different locations and we will look at a picture so that we get an idea. It is measured in terms of correlation or covariance of two random variables that are they're, they're, whose locations are identified in space. So now this is depending on the second moment of these random variables, that is the covariances, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, covariance metric. That is why spatial dependence is also sometimes termed as the second order property of a spatial random process. To understand it a little bit better, let's look at this picture uh, in front of your screens. So what you have is a combination of ridges and valleys. So the whites is where you have ridges which are at a height and the blues where you have valleys which are at lower depth levels, right? That's how we are visualizing a combination of ridges and valleys from top, right? So if you have a, a, a landscape where you have ridges in white, right? And valleys in blue, right? Uh, you have ridges and valleys occurring side by side. So you have a ridge, then you have a valley, then you have a ridge, then you have a valley and so on and so forth. The way ridges and valleys are distributed in space is quite random, right? There is no such pattern that ridges are occurring, uh, you know, together in a cluster, in a corner, valleys are occurring, you know, there's a large valley or different combination of many valleys occurring in a different corner. No, we have ridges and valleys, ridges and valleys spread randomly across space. So we don't really have any kind of spatial heterogeneity, so to say, in the trends of how ridges and valleys occur. They occur, you know, they are equally distributed across space. There is no specific trend. But what is happening is that the height of the height metric is clustered together at valleys at a certain level, which is a lower level. They are dependent, the height levels are dependent 
you know, with each other for a given valley. So you have lower height levels occurring together that forms a valley. Similarly, higher height levels will occur together that is spatially in a spatially dependent uh, manner to provide us a ridge. And that's how you have ridges where you have higher height levels occurring together or in a clustered way on space and lower height levels occurring together in a clustered way in space as valleys, right? This is the fundamental understanding of spatial dependence, right? So using these two concepts, now as a, as a class exercise, I'm going to give you one minute and then we will also solve this class exercise together. But we'll give you one minute to now look at the picture on your screen, look at the image on your screen and figure out, characterize the spatial patterns in it specifically through the lens of spatial heterogeneity, do you see any trends and spatial dependence, okay? So we, will, we only have two tools, two instruments, spatial dependence, second spatial heterogeneity. Look at the picture and, uh, you know, figure out how would you characterize the image uh, in front of your screen. We'll give you, we'll come back in one minute and then solve the problem together. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so uh, uh, I hope you had a good look at the at the image in front of you and and tried to characterize spatial patterns. So let's look at the spatial patterns that we can look uh, that we can find in this image. First of all, focus on the red circles. What you see is that darker blue colors are occurring together as clusters on the you know northwest corner of the image. Similarly, lighter blue colors or whitish shade is occurring together and in clusters in the uh, northeast, uh, you know, or the right top corner of this image. This is a classic case of spatial dependence. That is to say that the value that is, you know, noted here on this, on this star uh, in, the, in the right top corner is quite similar to other values around it. Right? They are all low blue, less blue shade or low on the, on the, on the digital numbers uh, shade, right? In the northwest corner where you have darker colors, again, the, the value that is realized at any given point is quite similar to the values that are realized around it, right? So there is dependence in what we observe in a neighborhood of any given stars in these uh, red circles, right? Similarly, you have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, bottom left, uh, you know, circle of, of, of white shades clustered together. So the values in neighborhood are quite similar. And, you know, we have two other circles where you can see similar patterns, right? So you can draw these regions in this image where the values exhibit quite a strong spatial dependence in the sense that whatever value we, we observe at a given point is quite similar to what's happening around in this space. So this is the case of spatial dependence in the given image. So the given image provides us an understanding or exhibits spatial dependence patterns um, uh, that, we can, that we can delineate. The second thing that this uh, you know, image is able to also provide us an understanding about is spatial heterogeneity. As I said earlier, spatial heterogeneity is about spatial trends. So we should be able to see some kind of a trend of how the values are moving in space. So quite clearly, if we start at the northwest corner and we start coming to the center of mass of this image, we are moving from high values to low values. In other words, we are moving from clusters of high values to clusters of low values. This is a trend in space. This is what we, uh, we exhibit or we define as spatial heterogeneity. The average color shade in the region in Northwest is darker than the average or the mean color shade of uh, you know, in this image at the center of mass, right? So that's how there is variation in mean values in space 
and, and, and the way this is moving from high to low, from northwest to the centroid, from southeast in fact also to the centroid is exhibiting a one particular type of spatial trend. There is another spatial trend. If we start from northeast and come to the centroid, we are going from clusters of low or, or, or lighter shade to clusters of slightly darker shades, right? Similarly, if we go from southwest to the centroid, we see this spatial trend of type 2, which goes, which begins on one side at a lighter shade and goes up to a darker shade, which might be exhibiting higher values, uh, or, you know, than the lighter shades, right? So now we are able to characterize this image uh, in two different ways, right? So we started with this, with this raw image here, and we are able to, you know, delineate two different patterns here, right? One is of spatial dependence, where we have clusters of similar values in different regions in this space that we can mark, identify, and that gives us a better formal understanding of what's happening in this area. Second is we are able to delineate trends in how values are moving across space in a larger scale, right? So in general, spatial dependence occurs at a smaller scale than spatial heterogeneity. Spatial heterogeneity asks us to traverse a larger region, so a larger spatial scale, usually in general, than what spatial dependence would ask us to do. Spatial dependence will be clusters, so things happening in localities. Spatial heterogeneity is what happening in two different regions in this, uh, in this image, right? So this, uh, this is how, you know, we can characterize, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, any given image using the tools of spatial statistics that is spatial heterogeneity and spatial dependence. All right. So now we are going to sort of move forward in, uh, in, in, in this course and, and, and uh, do a detailed introduction of geostatistical data. What I want to talk about is, you know, provide an introduction before we move into the machinery of spatial statistics, we want to sort of talk about where do these data come from, right? We have been looking at some, the, some of these very fancy maps, you know, they look very interesting, they are stark, um, they give, they provide us a lot of understanding of what's happening around us. But we want to understand where do they come from, right? I mean, unless we understand the data generating process, you know, we may not be able to fully appreciate the tool set or the toolkit that is spatial statistics, right? So we are going to talk about the DGP or the data generating process, which is usually uh, thought to be a very important component of statistical analysis. We should know where our data comes from. We should know how it is generated to be able to model it or to be able to make formal, you know, define formal statistics around it, right? And we will also talk about, we will also look at some popular sources of data so that the, uh, the students, you know, who are taking this course they can go back and look at these courses and maybe just, uh, you know, play with these data and, and try and get an understanding of what kind of, you know, uh, uh, what is possible with these data. Okay. So we will begin with some terminology. Uh, first important term terminology when it comes to geostatistical data uh, is remote sensing. Remote sensing is science of acquiring information about objects from a distance without any physical contact between the sensor, that is the one that is sensing information, and the target, that is the object of study. So the idea is that we are supposed to be studying is it an object without really touching it, right? Without even, without really measuring it uh, in, in physical sense. We are supposed to do it from a distance. And what is satellite remote sensing? Well, that is acquiring information about the Earth's surface. surface. So now the target or the object of study is the Earth. And we are using sensors, you know, attached to satellites. So we are talking specifically about satellite sensors or high-flying aircrafts, right? So this is done by sensing and recording reflected or emitted energy and processing, analyzing, and applying that information, right? So this is the second terminology, remote sensing, satellite remote sensing. The third term that I want to uh, talk about here is GIS or the Geographical Information System. GIS is a system which is a combination of both software and hardware designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present or visualize geographic and spatial data. 
So GIS is a software interface that allows us to visualize the data, store the data, analyze the data, manipulate the data, right? So GIS is really the physical entity that allows us to work with these data in practice, right? The data by themselves are coming from sensors that are placed away from the object of interest or what we call as the target. A bit of, you know, understanding of remote sensing process components, you know, what you see here is a source of light, right? The source of light hits the target, which is the Earth's surface. Some of the energy is, absor is absorbed and some of it is going back to this satellite sensor, which is roaming around in space, right? So the sensors collect, sensor collects this uh, information in, the, in terms of energy received after reflection from the Earth's surface, which is finally received by a system on Earth where it's processed, analyzed, manipulated, stored, and so on and so forth, right? So the imagery that we saw towards the beginning of this course in the first lecture really went through all this process, right? So, so all this, you know, technology is going into getting that data to us, okay? So uh, there are these live satellite path observers uh, you know, by the US Geological Survey that you can visit online through their Earth Now tool, where you can actually see satellites, you know, moving in their paths in space. For example, in the image on your screen, you know, you can see Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, uh, you know, uh, 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 going around in the space towards in, in, in high seas in the west of the uh, US California, uh, you know, uh, 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 region. Right? So what's happening is that the satellite moves on its path and it, as it moves on its path, it clicks a picture, right? So it basically moves a step, clicks a picture, moves to the next step, clicks another picture, moves it to another step, clicks a picture. These pictures are then made available by the US Geological Survey or NASA or in India's case, the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO, right? India has a satellite called Resource Sat, right? And it's the sensors are specifically designed, the Indian sensors are specifically designed to predict, you know, climatic events like cyclones, right? Which are of the most important importance to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Indian region, which experiences uh, these events due to its large coastline, right? So, uh, so, so this is another picture, another example, which gives you an idea of what we call as the satellite scanner SWAT. So you have a satellite which is going, which is moving from, uh, you know, uh, uh, south to north on the, on, on, on Chinese, on, on, uh, over China. And then finally it's over Russia, uh, you know, at this point of time, when it, when this picture was, when I, when I took this screen grab, um, this was, at uh, over Russia on 21st June 2021, uh, given at a given time period uh, with coordinate 63.61 and 118.5. So it's on that, uh, and on that spot, it clicks a picture, right? It takes a picture, the picture is of certain size. For example, Landsat, each picture will be of size 185 kilometer by 185 kilometers. So each picture is so huge, right? It covers that level of area on Earth, right? And you can actually visit this live observer on earthnow.usgs.gov uh, slash observer. Do visit this. It's pretty fun to, to go over this material. Again, another example, you can take a look at it online when you visit uh, the website. So I want to just very quickly uh, not spend too much time on this uh, idea of major satellite sensors, the countries of origin, other, other details. So if we talked about sensors and satellite sensors, so I just wanted to give you some information about where these sensors are, what, these sen what are their different characteristics, when were they really released first, right? And, 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 uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So first one I have here is Landsat. So Landsat is NASA's satellite sensor, that is, a, that is NASA is the space uh, organization of the United States. And NASA started its observation in 1972. So 1972 to 1999, we have Landsat 1 to 3. The sensor had four bands, four different bands, four different frequencies at which it was recording data. 
and you know it's each swath was 185 kilometers that means each picture that it clicked was 185 kilometers by 185 kilometers so this is the size of each image that you know the sensor clicks at every instant that it is on space right so it's continuously moving on space it it comes to the same location in every 16 days right uh, landsat 1 to 3 every 16 days it comes to the same location it clicks a picture the size of the picture is 185 kilometers by 185 kilometers from 1984 to 2011 nasa had a more advanced sensor called landsat 4 and 5 right so these had seven bands that's why these were more these, these gave more finer details of uh, you know the happenings on earth right uh, the second difference between landsat 1 to 3 and uh, and uh, landsat 4 and 5 is the resolution of the band so 60 meter resolution means that each pixel on this 185 kilometers 185 kilometers by 185 kilometers picture each pixel that is the smallest entity at which information is available that is the resolution of the data is 60 meter by 60 meter this resolution increased from 60 meters to 30 meters when a new sensor was launched in 1984 right sensors kept evolving we are right now we right now have landsat 8 going uh, over us uh, uh, clicking pictures gathering information you know it 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 went up in 2013 it still has a 30 meter uh, resolution but it has 11 bands so these are more sophisticated bands you know they are they are used for closer investigation of, of of coastal waters aerosol concentrations that is air pollution an idea of air pollution so you have more sophisticated technology as newer and newer sensors are sent to space so us is not the only uh, of course not the only country which uh, which sends out these uh, these uh, these sensors you know isro in india sent out the avif sen uh, sensor uh, which is a which is a lower resolution which is 57 meters resolution and a very large swath which is every image that AWIFS gets us is 730 kilometers by 730 kilometers okay so it's a huge image and every pixel is 57 meters by 57 meters why should we have a larger area coverage uh, for an Indian satellite as I said the target the object of of, of recording information is to predict climatic events like cyclones and these are large scale events so it's okay to have large you know areas covered at one point of time in fact it's more powerful for climate prediction purposes right so we also have things like Japanese sensors we have sensors from European Space Agency uh, there are also now private sensors right so so you have spot which is Airbus Defense and Space, so it's a commercial satellite. What you see here is a very high resolution satellite, so 1.5 meter resolution. Imagine the Indian satellite has the smallest pixel size as 57 meters, whereas the SPOT satellite has 1.5 meters. It's an incredibly fine level of uh, information is available through these private, uh, privately available uh, you know, sensors. Of course, they are paid, they are not free. Uh, freely available right we also have satellite called sky sky skysat or terabella which is a Goog which is google's uh, sensors in space and of course it is also you can see it is a very high resolution sensor okay so um, i want to very quickly sort of continue our, our data generating process so one more term that i want to introduce is called the ge geographic coordinate system and map projection which allows us to provide coordinates to the data so a geographic coordinate system is a three dimensional reference system that locates point, points on Earth's surface. The unit of measure is usually decimal degrees and a point has two coordinate values, a latitude and a longitude. Many of the students might be aware that when you have spatial data, when you look at Google Maps, at every point that you point your finger or your, or your, you know, or your, or your, uh, you know, uh, uh, marker, you can, you actually see coordinates. So these coordinates are nothing but a map projection, which is, not, which is a systematic transformation of latitudes and longitudes of a location from the surface of a sphere or ellipsoid into locations on a plane. And there are different types of systems that are used to create these projections. A picture will help give you an understanding of what is a geographic you know, projection uh, uh, system.
So you have a you have a, a, a sphere on which you want to you want to provide these coordinates. What you do is you take a, a, a torch on this side or a light source on this side and project how the sphere would look like on a two dimensional piece of paper. Once you do that, you know, you can then assign x, y coordinates like we know how to do that on a two dimensional space and then finally roll it back to the sphere to, to assign the coordinates on that sphere. Right? So what you're doing is you're bringing this 3D information from a light source to a 2D and on 2D we are well aware of how to assign uh, coordinates on a graph which is x, y coordinates. Right? And we call them latitudes and longitudes and we assign them back to our sphere, roll them back to our sphere and that's how we have geographic coordinates. All right, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will, uh, we will study spatial data structures, specifically vector data and raster data, and we'll see how, how spatial data are, are stored in different formats. And, and I look forward to having you there. Thank you for your attention.